reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When he entered Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had gathered, he said to them, My brothers, although I had done nothing against our people or our ancestral customs, I was handed over to the Romans as a prisoner from Jerusalem. After trying my case, the Romans wanted to release me because they found nothing against me deserving the death penalty. But when the Jews objected, I was obliged to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no accusation to make against my own nation. This is the reason then I have requested to see you and to speak with you, for it is on account of the hope of Israel that I wear these chains. He remained for two full years in his lodgings. He received all who came to him, and with complete assurance, and without hindrance, he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Verbum Domini. The just will gaze on your face, O Lord. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his searching glance is on mankind. The Lord searches the just and the wicked. The lover of violence he hates. For the Lord is just, he loves just deeds. The upright shall see his face. send you the spirit of truth, says the Lord. He will guide you to all truth. Dominus Fobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem. Peter turned and saw the disciple following whom Jesus loved, the one who had also reclined upon his chest during the supper and had said, Master, who is the one who will betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, what if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? You follow me. So the word spread among the brothers that that disciple would not die. But Jesus had not told him that he would not die just what if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? It is this disciple who testifies to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things that Jesus did, 
but if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world would contain the books that would be written. Verbum Domini. In the year 1821 in Hamburg, Germany, was born a boy named Hermann, Hermann Cohen, born to a Jewish family. And as he was growing up, his first, the first one that he would look to was his own father, who was a very wealthy man, very materialistic, no thought of God or the eternal things. And then at the age of six, he begins, Herman begins his piano studies with the most revered uh, professor of piano in Hamburg, Germany, who declared him a genius. And so now he's looking to this man who was giving a lot of scandalous uh, you know, behavior and decided that he would imitate him going to different places where he was, seeing how he would put on airs and people doting on him, this young prodigy. Then later at the age of 12, when his father's business had collapsed, his mother was going to make sure that Herman would get all the training he needed to be a successful musician. So she goes to Paris, taking Herman with her. He's just 12 years old. And he's accepted into the conservatory there in Paris to study under the most revered pianist at the time, Franz Liszt. And for two years, he would study. And after those two years, he would get high pay for different recitals that he would give. And he would do different things, but eventually he got involved, he got addicted to gambling. And he talked about the rage that would rise up within him when he would lose again and again and again. The darkness that kind of came over him, the sleeplessness, the insomnia, the despair, even thoughts of suicide. But then he would think, well, one more time. This time I'll make my fortune. And of course he wouldn't. But then something happened that changed the whole direction of his life. In fact, his cause for beatification is underway. I hope to see one day him on They Might Be Saints, Michael O'Neill's series on EWTN. So Herman Cohen's beatification is underway. And the thing that changed the whole direction of his life was that he was invited to direct the choir at a mass in honor of Our Lady that was going to also have benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. And it was during that when the priest elevated the monstrance with the sacred host and imparted the blessing that he felt impelled to kneel. And that he said that he felt like a prodigal who was facing himself for the first time. He felt, felt like he found himself he finally found what he was looking for. He began to go to daily mass, attending mass, not receiving Holy Communion. He was baptized on the feast of St. Augustine. Eventually, he would take as a religious name when he entered the Carmelites, Brother Augustine Neri of the Most Blessed Sacrament. Before this, he had begun also a movement called Nocturnal Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. And in a sermon, he talked about his futile search for happiness in the early days of his life. He said, I've sought it in the elegant life of salons, in the giddy pleasures of balls and banquets, in the accumulation of money, in the excitement of gambling. I have looked for it in the renown of the artist and the friendships of famous people, 
and all the pleasures of sense and spirit. But it was a futile search in those places. Where have I found it, he would say, at the feet of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. There's where I found it. And he would attribute his own conversion to the intercession of Our Lady, entering a community very devoted to Our Lady, the Carmelites, and eventually ending, his life would end in 1871, he's almost 50 years old, ministering to French prisoners and contracting smallpox and dying from that. Herman Cohen. I begin with that because Herman was looking first to his materialistic father, who had no thought of God. And then he's looking at his first piano teacher, who wasn't living a good life, imitating him, aping his behavior. Then he looks to Franz Liszt. Then he looks to success and money and the hope for full fortune. All of these different things, he gets in with a bad crowd. But then finally he's looking unexpectedly. Jesus is looking too, is looking at him. And when he looks at him, that's when he finds what he had been looking for, longing for, and he becomes this zealous missionary, founding Carmelite monasteries throughout the world. Herman Cohen, unstoppable missionary, a ze zealous missionary. Kind of reminds you of St. Paul, you know, how he was first wanting to do away with Christianity, had a hatred for Christ and his followers, and then later in his letters, we see that he's calling them his children, his beloved, his friends. Christ changed the whole direction. And so we see we, today, as we come to the conclusion of the Easter season, ending tomorrow on Pentecost Sunday, we have, we've been reading through the Acts of the Apostles throughout this whole season, and now we're reading the last sentences of the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 28 which concludes with verse 31 that we heard today. And St. Luke, we know, was the author of the Acts of the Apostles, as he was the Gospel. And he concludes with these words that he remained two full years in his lodgings. Now, if he says that he lived, he was there two full years, it means that Luke knows what happened after that, but he doesn't tell us. Some have thought, well, he was probably martyred. You know, he was beheaded there in Rome. Others say, well, there's evidence that he went to Spain or he went to other places. They speculate that possibility. Luke doesn't tell us, but he does tell us he was there for two years. And why is that important is because the central figure of Acts of the Apostles is not St. Paul. Although, of course, he's an important example of what Christ does. The central figure of the Acts of the Apostles is Jesus, the risen Lord. He's the one who says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And who would exhort him as Paul's going on his missionary activities to take courage or to go here, to go there. The Spirit is prompting him to do these different things. And so it is Christ who is that, the center now, the center of his life. He says, the love of Christ impels us. And Paul would say that in Galatians that he's gonna, he gave himself totally for love of me. And so Paul feels now impelled likewise to give himself totally for him. And so what are the last words in the Acts of the Apostles that we heard today? Paul with complete assurance, other translations have it, with all boldness and without hindrance, he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. The last words in Acts of the Apostles, the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, he tells us that 
In his first book, he wrote about all that Jesus did and taught. And at the end of Luke's gospel, he tells us of the ascension of the Lord and how the apostles worshipped him. They worshipped him. So Christ is obviously the, the center of his gospel, the center of the acts of the apostles. And then today we also have the conclusion of the Gospel of John that we've also been reading through during the Acts of the Apostles, the very last words in John's Gospel. And an important point here that our Lord brings out is that we aren't to be distracted or preoccupied with other things. So Peter said, well, what about him? You know, I like that saying that worry looks around I'm sorry, fear looks around, worry looks down, but faith looks up. And so, well, what about him? And what does Jesus say? What concern is that of yours? You follow me. Those are the last words we heard in yesterday's gospel. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know, you know I love you. And then at the conclusion of that, Jesus tells him, you know, when you were a young man, you dressed yourself, you went where you wanted. But you will be taken where you do not want to go. But you follow me. So even in those troubled times that await you, you follow me. You follow me. What about him? What concern is that of yours? You follow me. And that's a word for us today when we live in these fearful times. Do we look at the world situation? Of course, we have to be aware of it. We're praying for it. We pray here at EWTN. You join us in prayers for peace in the world. Do we look at different problems? troubles, divisions in the church? Are we just looking at that, focusing our attention on that? Are we just looking at ourselves, our own fallenness, our own weakness, our own troubles, the troubles of our lives? You follow me. Look at me, is what the Lord is saying to each of us. Look at me. During the Easter season, we have especially been looking and contemplating the resurrection of Jesus and his presence among us, the risen Lord. And to be a Christian is to be with the risen Lord, to know him. And not just an inward sense that we have of the risen Lord being with us, but encountering him. And how do we do that? How do we stay close to the Lord? How do we come into his midst? Well, he's given us the way, a profound way for us to be with him throughout our, our lives. Every day, if we want, for many of us, in the Mass. And the Mass is where the risen Lord is especially present to us. And by the invocation of the Holy Spirit, whom we're calling upon in these days before Pentecost Sunday. The risen Lord is present. His word is proclaimed to us. He speaks to us through the gospel and through the scriptures. He's speaking to us. He's speaking to our hearts. And we have a holy communion with the risen Lord. And those of you who aren't here, you make a spiritual communion so that we can be united with the risen Lord. To be a Christian is to be one who knows the risen Lord, is united with him, who's dying with him but also in our baptism, but now coming to a like resurrection. And he has ascended now at the right hand of the Father. He's taken our humanity there, where we hope to follow. We are already there by love. We already have a little foretaste of that life and that glory that is to come in our union with the risen Lord now, here, in the Mass, in his presence among us. So let that be a word for us today when we think about that. That Herman Cohen, 
that first he's looking to materialism, then he's looking to he's looking, you know, to this teacher who wasn't living a very moral life, imitating that person. And then he's looking to Franz Liszt, and then he's looking to gambling, or he's looking to riches, or he's looking to knowing famous people, or being famous himself. Where haven't I looked for happiness, he would later say in a sermon. But I didn't find it until I found it at the feet of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. You follow me. What concern is this of yours? All these things going on around us. Fear looks around. Worry looks down. Faith looks to him. You follow me. And if we do that every day with that intention, he's going to give us the direction we need each day. Today's all that we have. And what we want to do most of all is to look to him, to follow him, to let him lead us in the troubled times in which we live, not looking so much to them, praying for them certainly, but looking most of all to him, looking at him, following him, listening to his word, contemplating his word, being united with him in the Holy Eucharist, our great treasure this side of heaven. Because if we look to him, you follow me because he's leading us to glory. <laughs>